regular viewers of the channel will know that we've done quite a lot of stuff around gender, quite a lot of stuff around masculinity, and this is just such a big story and such an important moment to unpack, and such a complex thing to unpack as well. We were, we were called by The Guardian yesterday for a quote, and it just felt not appropriate to give a quote, knowing I, I, I'm a journalist, I used to work in the media for quite a while, so I know kind of how the quick turnaround news thing works, and it didn't feel right to give a quote that then might be taken out of context, because I think it's going to take us at least 40 minutes and maybe more to really unpack it. You, know, you mentioned you work in the media, I used to work in advertising as well, so it, it's a very interesting moment for an ad to be this kind of cultural lightning rod. Um, you know, I've, I've Having worked in an agency, knowing how an ad is made and knowing all the different dynamics that go on within it, um, it's, it's quite an interesting phenomena to, to observe. Yeah, and just for anyone uh, who's been living under a stone for the last couple of days and hasn't seen this, I mean, the, the amount of views that it's had, it was up to about 9 million views in a very short space of time, like two days. Hugely polarised reactions. It was running at about 10 to 1 dislikes to likes ratio. It's now up to about 4 to 1, which we'll talk about later, because that already some people are questioning whether that's kind of completely authentic. And it's really interesting. I thought it was done, in a way, it's done very well because these things, these huge amounts of budget behind it, and it's very easy to get polarised into, if you don't approve this, then you must be a sexist, you must be a misogynist. But you look at the level of the response, and either, and there are some people that, even I've seen people tweeting this, it's like, whoa, this was so needed because look at the level of response, look at the level of, there must be far more troglodytes, misogynists out there than we realise by the response to this film, and that's really unfair. But I think to unpack it properly, it's going to take a little while to look at the cultural context, to look at, play a few clips from some of the people we've interviewed, especially Warren Farrell, because I think his perspective is really valuable in this in this point. But let's, let's start by talking about the film itself. Yes. Because it was done by a very high profile director, Kim Gehrig, so a female director, who did a, a very well received and very successful campaign called This Girl Can. And we're, we're going to play a little clip from that now and we'll just sort of then unpack the differences and what it says about the cultural context. Mississippi putting it down, I'm the hottest round. And if you want me, y'all can stop me now. Is you with me now? The big, big, big bounce. I know you think the way I talk, talk, with my style. Get your freak on, get your freak on. This Girl Can, I think, is a great campaign. It actually, by, def by pretty much any definition, was a great campaign. It took a real need and a real issue, which is women feeling like they didn't want to exercise because they didn't feel confident in their bodies, they felt people were watching them. I, I have a lot of female friends who've told me about this, about the kind of feeling, especially like in the free weight section of the gym, like, oh, I don't really want to go in there. So it took that need, it did a great campaign around it, and it got something like, well, according to an award entry they did, you know, 1.6 million women doing exercise attributable to some way in that, to that campaign, which is great. So really different response to the Gillette ad, and I think part of that is because, so this girl can, everything in there is aspirational. It's, this girl can do this, she can do this, she can do this. It's, um, you know, kind of don't hold me down. Great, very empowering, nothing wrong with that. The Gillette ad, if it's this girl can, is very much uh, these men should. Completely different energy to it. Yeah, and I mean, it's very early to start saying whether the Gillette ad is a success or not, but the, the way that it sort of raced to a 10 to 1 dislike ratio, and then it's come back somewhat, I don't know whether that's just because um, a lot of kind of early adopters and people who kind of immediately hate clicked on the ad, were kind of anti the message. Yeah. But there's a lot of suggestions that, that um, Gillette are deleting some of the comments, that there is, um, in some sense, they weren't expecting the response that they got. And actually, um, I think you picked out on one of the ad agency campaign, yeah. campaign, a kind of official Bible of the ad agency, there's already been a senior ad person who said that this isn't a successful campaign. Yeah, and pointing out Fernando de Schut, who uh, runs New Macho, um, who was also an ex-brand director of Lynx, another brand that um, has men as their target audience. Uh, it's interesting what he was saying about it. I thought it was a really nuanced article he wrote. I was actually surprised 
to see a major advertising publication put that out there. So this is a guy who used to be the head of Lynx. Lynx, Lynx, and was responsible for Lynx rebranding um, from, uh, probably American viewers won't be aware of it, but Lynx, especially in the 90s, had really kind of crass advertising, which was the idea was, one of them was you spray yourself with Lynx and a woman actually falls out of the sky like, like an angel, you know. It, it, they were kind of, it was ridiculous, and they had to, they changed their positioning to be a bit more mature, and he did a very good job of that. So he was pointing out the fact, amongst many other things, about why the campaign isn't so great, is that <clears throat> it falls into the progressive man trap, he called it, um, and way oversimplifies what, where men are really at as well. You know, he's done this research with uh, looking, uh, talking to 2,000 men and women, and I thought one of the most interesting things he points out is that it's not that there's either progressive men or traditionalist men. M most men have, are holding different viewpoints at the same time. So I think they focus on the symptoms of masculinity, saying, okay, the, the main crisis has symptoms. Men are more violent, men are not well behaved with women, they are not well behaved with, with other men. So they focus on that and not what was the underlying issues. They focus on the symptoms. They, they didn't focus on men are in crisis, why they are in crisis. That is what I said in the article. They are in crisis because they are performing who they are and not being who they are. So instead of empower them to be who they are, they said, okay, why don't we teach them how to be? And that was then the, uh, the executional mistake. That is this idea of uh, teach them how to be and do it also in a, in a way that is not very authentic. So I guess if we're gonna frame this film that we're doing now, it's gonna be, we've done a whole series called Men and Women After Me Too based on the premise that if the cultural conversation right now looks like a dysfunctional relationship, and I think it does, what does a functional relationship look like? And why I think Warren Farrell is such an interesting voice in this is that he was one of the earliest and most high profile leaders of the feminist movement, and then started doing men's groups, listened to men's stories, and then became known as the father of the men's movement. And, but his real, skill and his real job is relationship counselling. Like he runs relationship counselling with his wife, he's a therapist. And it's like you cannot have a functional relationship between men and women if one side is not allowed to speak. The more I paid attention to the dialogues that were happening, the, the, the discussions that were happening in the men's groups I formed, I formed some 300 men's groups, and those were ways where men opened up and said what they felt in the safety of other men uh, who were saying, gee, I didn't realize anybody else but me felt that. And so, um, but then uh, when many of the men, when I started to incorporate those, um, what I heard in the men's groups, when I started to incorporate men's pain and feelings into my presentations um, to groups at colleges and universities, I found myself going from very large standing ovation, large audiences, standing ovations, and always being invited back to two or three more speaking engagements versus slowly all of that dwindled. And I knew that if I continued speaking and incorporating men's feelings and fears, uh, that I would continue to have fewer and fewer speaking engagements. And I had to make a decision. You know, did I want to have, you know, did I, now that I saw the formula, did I want to be formula speak and have a huge income and do very well and be very respected and, and, and applauded? Or did I want to go ahead and, and try to discover my best truth and speak up about that and try to represent and incorporate men and, uh, while still retaining a compassion for women um, and, and, and make that part of my life and my, my contribution. And I decided at least I would try to incorporate the best truth that I could. Why I think this is really key right now is we're in a cultural context. Immediately after Me Too, there was, it was actually said, men, now is not your time to speak. Now is your time to listen. Absolutely, I can understand that. I think we've said before, like, Me Too was a valuable, before it went too far, was a valuable speaking up of, of, of women who perhaps had never felt able to have a voice, have never been able to express some of the things that they expressed. Fantastic. And perhaps it was appropriate then for men to listen and women to speak. But you can't stay there, because by definition, that is not a relationship. 
It's not a relationship. It can't be a relationship. It's so where, when we're both allowed to speak, what would we be saying? And we've also got a very, um, quite a lot of lived experience, lived experience for want of another problematic term, um, because we lead men's groups. And what we see, so we see men coming to our, our groups with a whole range of different issues. But one of the big things that we see almost all the time is men with a real sense of shame around themselves as men. And I think that's such a big thing in the cultural context right now. And it's not recognized. It's not spoken to. It's still like we're, we're operating in the 1950s almost, where the big problem is just toxic masculinity. And it's a really unbalanced picture. And I think that's why this is such a difficult thing to unpick, because if, if you went through the, the film frame by frame, you'd probably agree with most of the, the pieces within it. Like, Yes, I think, I think as men we should kind of hold each other accountable. I think we should aspire to be the best that we can be. I think we shouldn't um, objectify women. I think we should stand up for the underdog. I mean, all of these things are valuable. But what is the cultural context that this is being put into? Yeah, and I think the other thing, just if, if I think back to what we experience leading the men's workshops, is that a lot of what we're... A lot of what we are experiencing together is getting into a space where we're authentically ourselves and we're not efforting. We're not coming from a space of, of feeling inadequate and having to prove ourselves by getting validation from the outside world, like I'll, I'll be the big tough guy, whatever it is. We, call, we talk about relaxed confidence. So it's a sense of being connected to myself, being authentically me, and from that space, I don't need to act out in these ways. Now, that comes from connecting to oneself. And that's an inner journey that we may do with others and with the support of others, but ultimately that comes from a place within. And one thing that is difficult about the ad is that it is effectively telling people how to behave. You know? And I think the, the refrain and the thing they have in the description is say the right thing, act the right way. And that for me, I know I totally agree with you, and I'm looking at individual points in the film, it's like, yes, well, I mean, that's being a decent person. Of course, I'm not going to disagree with a lot of that in the wider context, and the bizarre situation of Gillette, a razor company, t telling men to say the right thing, act the right way. A, who are they to say it? And B, what axioms are they basing that behavior on? I mean, it's usually that's the domain of religion or philosophy to, to decide what are the right ways to behave. How do we, you know, it's very bizarre. And it, it, it's an open question. I'm very curious. What is the right way to behave? and the right way to think and behave, and, you know, according to Gillette. Just, and just to preface a potential counter-argument, which I've seen to this point, which is that brands, because they have so many, they have such a big audience, that they, have a moral, that they do have a moral responsibility to tackle issues and look at social issues. Okay, let's assume that's true, and I think there's something in that. Brands do have a huge audience, and you know, a brand having a social role is not necessarily a problem in and of itself. But the nature of that role and the way it's executed can be a massive, massive problem. And, you know, in, in a lot of ways, and I think a lot of the pushback with Gillette has been this is far too much. And the tone in which it's delivered is condescending. It's patronizing. And the big issue goes back to that, you know, think the right way, act the right way. It's not really OK for anyone to say that, you know, there's no sense of inquiry into, OK, what is it like for men? What's going on? Let's have a really open discussion. It's more didactic. So yeah, I think the cultural context is the really important piece. Recently, there was an article in the Washington Post, Why Can't We Hate Men? Now, you could say that's an outlier, but for that to be commissioned by a mainstream publication, when no one could even imagine commissioning something, Why Can't We Hate Women? It's, it's a very... It's, it's this idea of do men, men do not have to fall for women to rise. And the other point, very recently, even about two or three days ago, there were the APA guidelines, which were clearly ideologically driven and were criticizing aspects of traditional masculinity, which included, they described as stoicism, ambition for the sake of it, in the end, they were forced to issue a clarification, and that clarification ended up pretty much saying, uh, well, men who pursue their own goals at the expense of everybody else are dangerous and bad, and 
in the end, they ended up describing a psychopath. Yeah. Like, psychopaths are bad. It's like, well, okay, so why did you call it traditional masculinity? I think Warren Farrell makes a really interesting point as well about how the cultural conversation is going right now, where, and we see it in the workshops, men are really quite confused and, and kind of scared about, it feels like a lot of people feel like they're walking on eggshells. I think part of that is because there's a huge social pressure to be more vulnerable, speak more, but then at the same time, he, Warren Farrell points this out, there's an equal pressure to shut the hell up and listen. On one level, we have a narrative that says men need to be much more in touch with their emotional side. Mm. They need to be much more, men lock things down and that's really bad and, and women are often complaining about that. And then on the other side, when men do say how they're feeling, they're often described as whining or complaining and there's, there's little compassion for it. This is exactly accurate. And this is, the, this is one of the challenges that we need to really confront is that, um, that we say, men, speak up share your feelings. It's like Lois Lane and Superman. Uh, Lois Lane wanted and begged Superman to cry, but she has zero interest in hearing about anything from Clark Kent. Um, women do want to hear men's feelings and hurts and pains if they're assured first that they're Superman, that they're the protector. But when they meet Clark Kent and he's more open about his feelings um, and his pain, um, this just turns women off. And women don't understand this about themselves. Uh, they think that, oh, you know, my husband really cried when his, when his mother was dying of cancer. I really supported that. So doesn't that mean I support a man expressing his feelings? The answer is yes and no. You, you're, you're supportive of a man expressing his feelings when, he's, when he has empathy for someone else's pain. You're not often supportive or look more introspectively about whether you are open to a man expressing his feelings of anger or hurt or upset about something that you did. And, but when you experience it as a criticism from your husband, from your boyfriend, oftentimes your boyfriend experiences you as backing off, as being less willing to be sexual, less willing to be emotionally open, uh, being more distant from him after that. He needs your love, he wants your love. When he expresses what hurts him and gives him pain and he sees that you back off, he tends to repress it because everybody else, as well as you in the society, has encouraged him to back off from expressing his weakness. In any culture, there will be some misogyny, but there will also be misandry. Because of, I mean, misogyny comes from, you have negative experiences with women, you have a bad relationship with your mother or whatever, and that can get internalized and some, we see it, that's, that, that acts out. Um, and I think, but the, uh, the topic of misandry, where women have bad experiences with men, bad upbringings, bad romantic experiencing, and then internalize a generalized resentment towards men, there is, it's not, most people don't even know what the word misandry means. Mm. And what's really, I don't think enough people recognize what a, the, the culture that we're in. For example, we did an interview with Cassie J, who did the, the Red Pill film. So it's a film about the men's rights movement. She went into that film genuinely as a feminist who was going to do an expose on the men's rights movement. And she had her mind changed during this film. We've interviewed her, her I've met other people who were involved in the film. I have no doubt that her journey was genuine. She was convinced that there were issues around men's rights that were not being reflected in the culture. And what was the reaction to that, to, to her film? In, in another universe, she would have been seen as a feminist hero. She, produced a, a very intelligent documentary in a very difficult area to make any kind of money in whatsoever and was very brave. She would have been seen as a feminist hero but because she didn't have the right opinions, the film was attacked. She was given a mauling on most of the kind of mainstream TV channels that she went on to. This happens. We recently put out a piece also by Heather Hying, who the evolutionary biologist around toxic femininity to say, okay, both toxic Femininity and toxic masculinity are very problematic terms, but if we're going to have one, then let's have the other as well and see, let's have that, let's have that conversation. I mean, I think the whole framing around it is, is, is dodgy, but let's, let's at least bring in both sides of the conversation. So that, I think, is the cultural context of why people are reacting to this. It's because it's part of an ongoing, perhaps overreacting to it as well, because it's part of an ongoing narrative that has come from the universities, postmodern relativism, and has been increasingly pushing out into the culture at large. Yeah. 
And I think this is the key thing in terms of the cultural context to understand. I've seen a lot of people asking, um, and I think with genuine confusion, why is anyone upset about this ad? You know, wh how could anyone have a problem with men acting this way? Um, and as we said before, it's not necessarily the behaviors that are going on. It's that within the framework of what you just mentioned of, let, let, let's just lay out the system basically of what this kind of, the kind of postmodern worldview is and, and why it matters to this conversation. So it breaks the world down into identity groups and then also breaks it down or reduces everything to power relations. So that's one thing going on within that framework. Men, especially with the kind of, um, the way third wave feminism is going right now, maybe not where it came from, but the way it, it goes in some circles, men are at the top of that hierarchy by definition. It doesn't matter what that man, you know, what his situation is, by, by virtue of his group identity, he's at the top of that power hierarchy. So in this extreme form, he's the cause of all the world's ills, is inherently in a position of power and privilege, and therefore needs to be in some sense and has been throughout history, yes, this is the key as well. Yes, exactly. And, and from that, what I've noticed is, is a sense of men are inherently dangerous and they need to be taught how to behave. And they need to, you know, we've talked before about this idea of testosterone itself being kind of a poison. And, you know, little boy, and this does happen, little boys in school being um, told not to roughhouse, being, you know, forced into behaving in a way that's more conducive and less masculine. Um, all of that is going on and it comes from a sense of, it comes from a very specific worldview and yes, and it's rampant in critical theory and universities in, in particular. In its most extreme form, and I think a lot of people have a slightly more nuanced take on this particular kind of ideology, but on its most, on its most extreme form, it obliterates any nuance. It obliterates, it fails to appreciate that men commit suicide at a far higher rate than women do. Men are imprisoned at a far higher rate. There are far more male failures. There are a group of hyper successful men and there are a lot of male failures at the other end, what some people have called the greater male variability hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And also obliterates the fact that throughout most of history, men were self-sacrificing for their families. They were, they were going to war. They were sacrificing their, life, their lives and their futures for others. And this is completely missed in this kind of idea that men were just hoarding all the power and privilege to themselves. It kind of feels like we're, we're stuck in a dysfunctional relationship between men and women that is now manifesting everywhere. Yes. And Warren, you've, you've done work with, with relationships for an awfully long time. Mm -hmm. Do you see that parallel? And if so, what do we do about it? Yes, we are, we are definitely caught up in, an, in a dysfunctional relationship. That would be kind. <laughs> um, um, men, uh, we, you know, we're asking men to, you know, to sort of express their feelings, recognizing that we're repressed. We're so repressed that we're the sex that commits suicide at a, at a level of six times, to, six to one uh, uh, over women when we're in our 20s and when we're 85 and older at 1,350% greater amount than, than women. And if that's not dysfunctional, then tell me what is. Um, suicide is probably the ultimate. Um, so in, in order for, so we're wanting men to open up on the one hand, and then we're saying, um, don't mansplain, you've dominated the conversation, uh, shut up, this is time for women to speak up, this is time for men to shut up. So totally com um, contradictory messages that men are getting, um, told that they're filled with power and privilege and yet, yet walking around in reality uh, feeling shamed and fearful and um, that women have a type of power that they're not even allowed to talk about because they're the ones with the power and the monopoly over it. So it's, it's, that is about as dysfunctional as it can get. We have to understand that we have these attractions to each other um, for, for fundamentally dysfunctional reasons. We were never designed to be functional. We were designed to survive. And now we have the opportunity for the first time in human history to be functional as well as surviving. And this is a whole new dialogue that needs to be together. But the feminists have monopolized that dialogue of women good, men bad, women the oppressed, men as the oppressors. And that's about as dysfunctional as you can uh, structure a dialogue. It's, it's, uh, it's like a person going into therapy and saying, I came here because, you know, my wife is 
filled with problems and, and I have been telling her what to do for many years and she doesn't pay any attention to my direction um, and she's 100% wrong on these 14 different items and I'd like you to help uh, align with me to help you understand how wrong she is. By the way, if you do align with me, I will continue hiring you as a therapist. I control the money, um, but if you don't align with me, that'll be the end of you as a therapist. And we're basically having feminists say to the world, if you want to teach in gender studies, you have this party ideology to follow. Uh, you have to you have to articulate that men. We live in a patriarchal world dominated by men um, that made rules to benefit men at the expense of women. And if you don't follow that ideology, there's not a chance in, that you'll get a, a job at any decent university um, unless that ideology is at your forefront. And you just have your own unique ways, which we give you many unique ways, no problem at all, as long as you have unique ways of expressing that ideology as effectively as possible to your to your um, students and do not deviate from that or allow anyone else to come into this university to talk in a different way about that. And so you, you cannot define, it would be hard to write a novel um, with a fictional um, situation that would be more of a dysfunctional um, dialogue, than, the, the monologue than the monologue that is happening now. We, you know, we've we used to have a battle of the sexes. That's been historical. Uh, but now we no longer have a battle of the sexes. We have a war in which only one side has shown up. The other side, called men, have put their heads in the sand and hope the bullets will miss. That's a dysfunctional dialogue. I've had conversations with people where they have simply denied that women have any power whatsoever, which is ludicrous. In, in a patriarchal system, it's impossible for a woman to have power, even in the sexual realm. I remember having a conversation where they were denying even that women have power in the sexual realm, which is not only just bizarre, but it also, it's incredibly demeaning towards women. Mm. It's demeaning, it's saying you, you, you're saying that women had no power and no agency throughout history until the 1960s. Really, I mean, that's just a completely ludicrous perspective to be coming from. Yeah, but it makes perfect sense in, the, in that postmodern context we were talking about before, where you, you cannot let go of the victimhood. You can't let go of it because it's where your power comes from in that game. So you have to, no matter what evidence is presented in the world around you, no matter how different the world is now than it, is, that it was in the 1950s, you must still, if you adhere to that particular religion, let's call it, you must still maintain that you are the victim. And, that, and then you have to find other victims as well. It's kind of a, you know, people have called it a race to the bottom. If we grant that women didn't have a voice in public until the 1960s, which, I'm, which I think is, is pretty true, um, and we're, we're hearing women's voices, women's stories for the first time for the last 50 years, w have we really heard men's emotional truths at all? Because it was never part of traditional masculinity that, that men would be emotionally vulnerable. So, okay, we, we've, we've only listened to women for about 50 years, but how long have we been listening to men's deeper truths about their experience? We have to realize that the male-female evolutionary dance has evolved as a tango for millions of years. And it's very important that women speak up about what they do and don't like about their parts of the tango. And that we recognize that there are thousands of different women from different backgrounds who have different answers to that question, that women don't just have one message to deliver on that issue. At the same time, all the exact opposite is also true. Um, it is not true that we haven't listened to women. We haven't listened to women speak the feminist message for more than a half century, but we haven't listened to men express their feelings ever at all. That was exactly the opposite of what masculinity was about. So let's open up and hear boys and men's stories. But what do we need to do? We need to know how to listen. So on the subject of men's uh, kind of emotional stories not being heard, it's also quite closely linked to that idea of men being forced to play certain roles or, you know, for whatever reason, playing certain roles. I think one of the best criticisms of the Gillette ad is actually from Fernando, the um, advertising guy we talked about earlier, where he points out that they are effectively doing exactly the same thing in that ad. They are saying, you must perform a certain role to be the right kind of man. So Gillette is really doing what Gillette was doing in the 1950s. This is how to be the right kind of man. And they're doing exactly the same thing. So they are effectively just, I'd say, moving the goalposts, repackaging it, 
and the core problem remains the same of pressuring and shaming people into behaving in a certain way. And hidden within that is the idea that unless you are threatened or compelled to act in that way, you won't act that way. That men by their nature are not good. That there is something inherently toxic about masculinity, about men. And that's what's, what's terrifying is that unless you're under this compulsion to, to rein yourself in and behave, you will act out. And that's, that's really, that's toxic. Yeah, and it's not true. Uh, I just think of, as soon as you say that, I think of um, the many beautiful moments of male support and um, brotherhood we see in the workshops. Um, I would quite like anyone who wants to from the Gillette marketing team to come to a workshop, but just to witness it, just to see how absolutely off the mark that is and how absolutely damaging and toxic it is to put that message out there. They make a big show about the boys of the future, you know, the boys right now will be the men of the future. Telling boys right now that there's something inherently wrong with them because of their sex, that's going to cause problems when they're men of the future. So thank you for watching. We're going to put the links to all of the other films below in the show notes, the Warren Farrell and all the other Men and Women After Me Too films that we've done. And I want to say thank you for, we've just hit 50,000 subscribers. So thank you very much for that. And? and also a thank you to everyone who's moved over to our members area on our website from Patreon. We're closing our Patreon um, at the end of this month. So if you want to support what we do and you want to get access to exclusive content and monthly calls, then there's a brand new forum. There's lots of great stuff on our members area of our website and Patreon will be no more. Our Patreon, let's say, will be no more in a few weeks. So that's the best way to support us. And we'll put info down in the show notes as well.